Radio Theater brings you Cary Grant and Lorraine Day in Mr. Lucky. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The zest and enthusiasm that Cary Grant puts into every performance must convince the most hardened cynic that Cary loves his work. He loved it enough to run away from school at the age of 13 to join a troupe of acrobats. He loved it at 15 when he was a knockabout comedian in vaudeville. And my guess is that he tried to give just as good a performance then as in these latter days when everybody looks forward to a new Cary Grant picture as an occasion for celebration. The latest case in point is the RKO hit, Mr. Lucky. And starring with Carrie and Mr. Lucky tonight is Lorraine Day, one of the screen's really brilliant young actresses. In fact, after seeing her work in Mr. Lucky, I picked her for the leading feminine role in the story of Dr. Wassell with Gary Cooper. Tonight's play has, has many surprise twists. On the screen, Mr. Lucky made a killing, as he himself would put it. Or, in plainer English, the picture hit the jackpot, drew the moolah at the box office. And that, that's never a matter of just being lucky. The producer of a play, a picture, or a radio drama like these that Lux Flakes bring you on Monday evenings can't trust to luck. He's got to rely on hard work, careful planning, and casting. And in these days, I'm sure the housewife is very sympathetic with that point of view. Shortage of manpower has caused a shortage of many other things. And so in most homes, things must be made to last longer than ever. The housewife who's had the wisdom to use Lux Flakes is certainly Mrs. Lucky. And now the curtain for Mr. Lucky and the first act, starring Cary Grant as Joe and Lorraine Day as Dorothy, with Arthur Hole as Swede. The night fog hangs low over New York's waterfront. At the end of a long pier, a girl paces slowly back and forth stopping at intervals to gaze out toward the sea. From the shadows of a dark building, a watchman peers at her suspiciously. Then with a sudden movement, he begins to walk quickly toward the girl. Hey, you there! Take it easy, brother. I wouldn't bother her if I were you. Oh, wouldn't you? Well, thanks for the advice. But how do I know she ain't going to jump? She's all right. She's not going to do anything. She's just going to stand there and look out to sea. She ain't got no right out there without a pass. Brother, she could have a pass to the White House if she wanted it. She's a somebody. Speaking of passes, where's yours? Oh, you're new here, aren't you? Take a look. Oh, ship's master, huh? You see? I told you she was all right. She's just standing there. Well, what's she going to do now? She's watching for a ship to come in. Only it's sitting at the bottom of the Atlantic. What ship is that? Used to be called the Fortuna. Oh, yeah, that gambling ship. She used to be sitting right here at this dock once. That's right. She was owned by a boss gambler called Joe the Greek. You ever hear of him? Oh, sure I did. Did you know him? Yeah, I was master of the Fortuna. Say, tell me, was he really a Greek? No, uh, nobody ever knew what he was except tough and too smart for his own good. Oh. <laughs> crossed you up, huh? No, he crossed himself up. Uh how? -huh. That girl there. Right here on this pier was the last time she ever saw him. When was that? Back a ways when we had the Fortuna tied up here. We weren't operating then. We were broke and full of trouble. One day, that was in October 1941. You see, we'd been driven off the West Coast by the law and put in here to raise a bankroll so we could operate in Havana. Joe was kind of up against it. Little Greek sailor we had aboard, a guy named Boscopolis, was pretty sick. Joe came waltzing up the gangplank with his face full of fine and dandy and his heart full of ice water. Hiya, Swede. How's Biscopolis? Looks like he's going to join Barnum and Bailey, Joe. Yeah, what'd the doc say? Well, according to the doc, he's already gone. Uh-huh. He said he wouldn't last over an hour, two hours ago. All gone inside. Say, how'd it go uptown today? Well, thanks, sweet. I got the plans to take off the boat. We can sail it any time. Good. You know those mugs of yours are getting kind of restless. Oh, yeah? Well, let me know when Bascopolis goes. I'll be in the gambling room. Right. 
Hey, fellas, here's Joe. Oh, Hello, boys. Well, anything happened today, Joe? Plenty. Boys, I got it. Yeah? You mean the boat's released? Cost me ten grand, but it was worth it. Look at that. Signed by his honor, the Superior Court Judge. It took seven lawyers to write it up legal and Joe to do the fixing. <laughs> here's that. Put it in the safe. Boys... We're sailing for Havana as soon as Vescopolis kicks off. Forget it, Joe. This ship ain't going nowhere. Huh? Who says so? Your Uncle Sam. What is this, Zepp? A rib? Yeah. Take a gander at these little postcards. They arrived this morning. Oh, yeah? Hmm. Jane Vescopolis, G. Zepp, Joe Adam. Oh, that's me. Hey, what is this thing? It's from your draft board, Joe. You've been classified. 1A? They can't do this to me. I'm a civilian. That's what you think. Take a look at mine. I got the same thing. They don't even give you time to cut off a leg. Listen, this isn't my war. I had my war. Crawling out of the gutter the hard way. I won that one. I don't recognize any other war. Ah, it's okay, Joe. Don't worry. I got it all fixed. Yeah? Well, go on, Crunk. Well, we can hop a plane out of here for Mexico City in two hours. What? Yeah. From there, we catch a plane for real. Oh. You can wake South America till this soldier business blows over. Oh, yeah, sure. Take it easy, Crunk. You think I'm going to give up the boat on account of this card? None of you other guys got one, huh? Just you and me and Biscopolis. Oh. Now, where's Biscopolis' card? What did he get? Hmm. 4F. What's that? Means they don't want him. He's physically unfit. They're lucky stiff. Yeah, he's physically unfit, all right. <laughs> he's just about dead. Or is he? Oh, you mean, uh... <laughs> yeah, I get it. All right, boys, get lost. Joe and me want to talk. Oh, all right, come on. Get out of J. Biscopolis, 4F. One of us is out of the army, Joe. Yeah, who declared you in? Well, we're partners, ain't we? That's a 50-50 proposition in my book. <laughs> what do you want, half the card? I'll trade you my half the boat for the card, Joe. What good will the boat do me in the army? The one that gets the card gets the boat along with it. Who gets it, Joe? You want to cut for it? No. Poker dice. <laughs> All right, you got a deal. I'll get the dice. Wait a minute. Can't you wait and make the thing legal? What's wrong with poker dice? Not a thing, only the guy ain't dead yet. I never took anything off a pal in my life. After he joins the circus, well, that's different. Come on in, Crunk. Is the doctor still here? Yeah, it's all over, Joe. Boscopolis just kicked off. Mm, okay. Here's the dice. Take your best shot, Zep. Right. The winner gets the draft card. And the boat. Shoot him. Hey, 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 come on. Keep your hands above the table, Zep. What do you mean, Joe? Roll them. Oh, sure, Joe. Three kings. Three kings. It's up to you, Joe. Yeah. Nice rolling, Zep. But this ain't amateur night. I don't get you. Don't you? Didn't you see an elephant walk across the table with muddy feet? I didn't play the switch on you, Joe. Didn't you? Then blow on him for luck. Go on, blow. Okay, sure. That's right. I wouldn't shove around my own partner. Sure you wouldn't. <laughs> Three kings to beat, huh? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Holy smoke! <laughs> Read them, Zep. What do you say? Three aces? Yeah. Well, Zep, take good care of yourself. I'll have a nice big service flag hung up with a single star on it. Just for you. <laughs> Well, that's the way Joe Adams got to be Joe Biscopolis. That afternoon, he went uptown again with Crunk to raise $50,000. We needed that much dough so we could sail. Well, how about it, Joe? Did you raise the wind? Raise the wind? I couldn't even raise a good cough. I don't know what's happened to this town. What about all them soft touches, you know? Ah, the heat's on. They either got caught in the draft or went square and paid their income taxes. <laughs> income taxes. That well, looks like our luck is out. Hey! Boss, look. Look at what? That car parked there. What about it? Look at the license. 7L 7777. Five sevens, five naturals. Oh, this is going to change your luck, boss. Come on, come on, get in. No, you get in. I'll wait here. What? Boss, you know it's no good if we both don't get in together. What's the matter? You're trying to jinx it or something? Come on. Uh, okay. I beg your pardon, sir. That's I... okay, bud. We just want to sit in the back for a second. Uh, but the lady I drive for... It won't hurt anything. Now, sit down, Crunk. Oh, boy, five naturals. Uh, please, sir, the, the lady... Yeah, yeah, take it easy. Is that long enough, Crunk? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Oh, get out. This guy's getting nervous. Howard, we'll go right back to... Oh. Oh. Sorry. 
Uh, Miss Bryant, these gentlemen just opened the door and sat down. I, I, I don't know. It's all right, Howard. How do you do? Uh, hmm. How do you do? Can I sell you a ticket to our charity ball? Oh, sure. One or two? Uh, two. Here you are. They're $50 apiece. Oh, just fifty. Oh, cheap affair, isn't it? <laughs> Not exactly. But we're trying to raise $100,000. Are you now? Well, that's a coincidence. Yeah, what's it for, sister? War Relief Incorporated. Hmm, I'm interested in relief. Where are your headquarters? The address is on the ticket. I see. Well, here, you keep the tickets. I'll look you up. As a matter of fact, I may throw something your way. Well, thank you. <laughs> beg your pardon, but but did you say you wanted to contribute seventy dollars to our war relief, or or was it seven hundred? Neither. I said seventy thousand. Yes, yes. I I thought. Well, do sit down. Do, Mister. I, I I don't believe I got your name. Joe. How are you? Uh, Joe. Oh, oh, Mr. Joseph. Well, you couldn't have come at a more timely moment. You know, we have to send a whole shipload of medical supplies to Europe. I do hope you want to make your donation in cash. I always do business in cash. Oh, that's splendid. You'll have to help me, though. Oh, of course. Well, you see, I'm a boss gambler. That's my business. Oh, we never inquire into one's association. Yeah, now, now, this charity affair of yours, that's made to order. All you have to do is give me the gambling concession. Gambling? Sure, blackjack, chuckalock, roulette. I'll raise the dough for you in one evening. I, I don't understand. Well, it's simple. You're given a ball, we take rooms next to it. All you have to do is steer the customers in. I supply the dealers, the tables, the layout. All you have to do is sit back, rake in the winnings. But are there always winnings? Suppose you lose. We can't. Now, look, I'll show you what I mean. Here's the dice. You roll them. You're the customer. Shall I? Sure, go on, roll them. There, you see, snake eyes. <laughs> you lose. Now, what's the difference? Seven. I win, see? I'm lucky. I can't lose. Well. I'll do it again. This time, I'll make a dump shot. A what? Dump shot. Oh. Hand me the glass. Now, watch. Say, seven. How do you do it? Influence. <clears throat> Look, uh, you bring me the right people, I'll get you that 100000 But it's gambling. Not the way I do it. It so happens that gambling is against the law in this country. Oh, hello, you. Oh, well, Dorothy, this is Mr. Joseph, my lieutenant, Miss Bryant. I've already had the pleasure. It so happens, Mr. Joseph, that we have a committee of financial advisors. Strange, they've never hit upon your plan if it's so sound. Well, not everyone can do it, uh, lieutenant. It's sort of... Uh... Dangerous? <laughs> That's what I mean. Oh, oh! I'm, I'm afraid Miss Bryant's right. Perhaps if you send us a letter explaining your plan in detail... Yes, and we'll be glad to take it up at our next meeting. But you're in a hurry for this, though. You can't afford to wait for meetings. Well, we can't afford to sponsor something we might later regret. Hey, now, wait. Dorothy, don't forget your appointment at the bank. Oh, all right. Thanks. Goodbye, Mr. Joseph. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Joseph. Uh, hey, look. What bank is she going to? Why, it's at 31 East 39th. Oh, Thanks, Tuts. Listen, boss, this ain't no bank. This is a blood bank. That's the difference. Where's the girl? But they take away your blood here. You want to lose your blood? Quiet, Crunk. Yes, please. Good afternoon. Hello, Miss Bryant. This is your third visit, isn't it? Yes. We'll have your silver button waiting for you as soon as you're through. Thank you. Sit right over there, please. Well, hello. Hello. Well, well, this is quite a surprise. Not particularly. It so happens I rather expected it. Ah. And if you think your persistence is going to have any effect on me, you're mistaken. Well, now, I can't see how you people can pass up $100,000 for the cause. For whose cause? If you're so interested in serving the cause, why don't you join the army? Oh, well, I'm 4F. You look 1A to me. Oh, you don't look so bad yourself. I... <laughs> <laughs> Well, you see, it's just my arteries of 4F. See? There's well, the card. See? Bascopolis? J. Best. That's right, Bascopolis. I thought you said your name was Joseph. <laughs> well, well, if a fellow went around calling himself Bascopolis, think what the other people would call him. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Look, uh, <clears throat> why didn't you let me finish when I was trying to tell that lady at the war charities? It huh? so happens that I don't trust your motives. Oh, that's great. Here I am giving my life's blood, and you don't trust my motives. The person who gets your life's blood will probably develop a sudden passion for the dump shot. Yeah? And the poor soldier who gets your blood, they can use him for an ice cube. Next, Miss Bryant. Ready. 
Goodbye, Mr. Viscopolis. And the answer is still no. Hey, boss, 1A is back. Huh? Zap, he ain't in the army yet. Hiya, Joe. What's he doing? Oh, how come you're not in uniform, Zep? Well, I got a couple of weeks before I go to camp. I ain't got any place to flop. Okay, if I stay here on the boat. Sure, why not? Well, thanks. Are you coming with the bankroll? <laughs> I got a crack at the biggest bankroll in New York, if it works. Oh, well, what's holding it up? An iceberg. And I'll melt it down. Yeah. Okay, if I get something to eat. Sure, go down to the galley, see what they got. Thanks, Joe. Thanks a lot. Boss, when you clean out a guy like Zepp, you had no to keep him around. Hey, is that any way to treat a soldier, Crunk? Yeah, but I'm telling you, Chief, a guy like... Crunk, never give a sucker an even break. And always keep an eye on a pal. <laughs> Remember that. Mm -hmm. Hey, where can I get a car? I got to put on the dog for a few days. Well, I know a fellow in town's got a sedan. Well, get it. Meet me on the dog in half an hour. Okay. <laughs> Yes? Oh, Miss Bryant, there's a recruit out here in the office. I, I don't know what to do about it. Well, hang on to her. We can use anybody. But, but Miss Bryant, it's rather a special case. Well, send her in before she changes her mind. Oh, hello. Oh, what do you want here? Oh, well, I'm her. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about what you said yesterday, and I was, uh, well, I was wondering why you couldn't use me in this setup. You mean you want to enlist in this organization? Yeah, it's time for every man to do his bit. If it wasn't for this weak heart, believe me... Arteries. I, 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 oh, yeah, arteries. Why, it's the same thing. How about it? What about this gambling at the ball business? Oh, I forgot it. Too bad. It was a good idea. Yeah, good for the cause, too. Well, let it go. Well, I have no right to refuse any enlistment. However, I think I should warn you. <laughs> We've had a few men before, but they all asked to be transferred to more active branches. So many women around got on their nerves. <laughs> oh, that won't bother me. I might have known. But perhaps you'd better read this first. We expect a lot of our workers. Uh, thank you. Do you, uh, do you mind if I sit down, please, uh, ma'am? No, of course not. Uh, Dorothy, I just thought of... Oh. Oh, hiya, Tits. Hiya. <laughs> He's going to enlist, Veronica. Enlist? Really? Yes, ma'am. <gasps> you're sure you know what you're doing? I'd do anything to help the cause, anything. Oh, I think that's wonderful. Well, perhaps you're right. The discipline will be good for him, too. Of course. Now, you fill in the application, and I'll get you a button. Thank you. Sign on the bottom line, Mr. Baspopoulos. No, no. <laughs> Baspopoulos, I didn't think you'd forget me. <laughs> I don't intend to. Uh, you mean sign here? That's right. Uh. Here's your button. Now you're one of us, Mr. Uh... Vescopolis. Oh, Greek? America, naturalized. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, well, Dorothy will take care of you and come and tell me how you're getting on. Yes, thanks. Perfectly wonderful. Well, everything's fixed. I'm in. Stand up. Huh? Take your hat off my desk. What? Put out that cigarette. Yeah, but, Recruits but... are not allowed to smoke during office hours. And before you leave, put a fresh bottle of water on that cooler, please. Oh, uh... Yeah, sure. Um, how would you like to begin with a propaganda project? Uh, yes, sir, or madam. Uh, now tell me, do you know how to knit? Knit? I ask if you knew how to knit. Knit? In England, men who are incapacitated knit without hesitation. Knit? Why, the best knitter I ever saw was Wing Commander Barnstable. He picked it up while he was in a plaster cast. I don't knit. That's exactly the attitude we're trying to combat. Now, look here, I don't mind... We I... want a group of obviously masculine men to take up knitting. Do it perfectly casually in public places. Hmm. You think I'm strong enough? <laughs> I'm quite serious. Uh. Half the women who were knitting for us last year are now learning to drive ambulances and run buses. Yeah, but look... You don't seem to have caught the idea of the organization you've just joined, Mr. Viscopolis. We're people who won't be able to get into the actual fighting. We resent that fact. So we take our resentment out in doing our best to help when and how we can. Oh, well, I'm not backing out. I can't knit because I don't know how. That settles it. Report to Mrs. Van Every. She's our best instructor. Well, now, wait a minute. I... Or do I tear up this application? Oh, uh, okay, okay. I knit. Good. You may report to Mrs. Van Every. Thank you, madam. <laughs> I knit. Go ahead. Well, look, just one more thing. Yes? 
When do I get to trim a hat? Before Mr. DeMille presents Cary Grant and Lorraine Day in Act Two of Mr. Lucky, it's time for mail call. Just a quick look at a few of the letters we've received from men in uniform. You see, a lot of boys who've never washed so much as a pair of socks in their lives are learning to cope with the laundry problem and writing in to tell us how Lux Flakes have helped them solve it. One boy writes from Georgia that when he was washing his fatigue uniform with Lux, the fellows couldn't figure out how he got so many suds in the tub. And a sailor, storekeeper second class to be exact, tells us that other Lux fans are pikers compared with him. He uses Lux for his blue uniforms. Says it gives him a fine lather, rinses out easily, and leaves the wool soft. Another Navy man, a CB from one of the construction battalions, passes along a smart idea. He luxes his blue uniforms, too, and uses an old toothbrush and Lux suds to get the white braid clean. I guess we could say, Sally, the boys are getting uniformly good results from Lux Flakes. That would be putting it mildly. Well, that's the way to put it when you're talking about Lux, isn't it? Seriously, though, Lux is mild and gentle. That's why it's such safe care, not only for Army and Navy uniforms, but for civilian washables, too. Sweaters and dresses and blouses. It helps washables last longer because it is so very gentle. It's thrifty to use. A little gives you so many rich, long-lasting suds. So don't waste, Lux. Use all you need to get good suds, but no more than you need. Next time you shop, be sure you get Lux Flakes. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of Mr. Lucky. Starring Cary Grant as Joe and Lorraine Day as Dorothy. Yeah, this Joe was a funny guy. There he was, working in that war charity place, trying to get next to some easy dough so we could open the gambling ship. Looked like everything was going his way, too. Only there was a couple of things he didn't know. Number one. That Zeb guy was never drafted. When he went for his physical, he got a 4F. Number two, Zeb knew something about the real Joe Biscopolis. He knew he was a three-time loser who had to report to the parole board every month. But what Joe didn't know wasn't hurting him. Not yet, anyway. Well, down at the war charity place one morning, there was a little trouble. The ladies were in some kind of a jam about money. All I know is I want 1,200 bucks. Please don't shout. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me, ladies. Good morning. Oh, good morning, Mr. Biscopolis. Well, what seems to be the trouble? Well... Well, she owes me 1,200 bucks. That's the trouble. He's trying to charge us $6 apiece for some second-hand blankets. I could have got 10 bucks. Millions of refugees shivering in tents. And this creature tries to hold us up. You ought to be ashamed of yourself raising your price just because blankets are hard to get. That's the old law of supply and demand, lady, and it ain't been repealed yet. Six bucks a piece. Where's my check? I tell you, we haven't it in our account. All right. All right, then. I take back the blanket. Well, now, wait. Now, wait. Look, you look like a pretty good sport, Mr. Uh... McDougal. Uh, Mr. McDougal, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll flip you. I'll give you 2,000 or, uh, or, uh, 600. If I lose, I'll pay for it out of my own kick. I wouldn't want to have those shivering refugees on my conscience. Now, uh, what do you say, Mr. McDougal? 2,000 or 600? Yeah. You're on. Okay, well, I'll toss the coin and you... Heads. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I am sorry. I couldn't do it with this coin. You see, it's got tails on each side. I got it from a gambler. I wouldn't want to jip you. See, you'd have lost. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, now, uh, what do you say we do that old uh, behind-the-back routine? Behind-the-back? Yeah, you guess what hand it's in, you know? Oh, yeah, sure. Go on. All right, now, uh, are you all ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, which hand? The left. The left. Well, let's see. Nope. No, it isn't in the left. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Mister McDougal. We get the blankets for six hundred, though. Oh, huh? now wait a minute. You ought to give me another chance to break even, double or nothing. Oh no, no, I don't think I could do that, Mister McDougal. Some of the main guys in here don't like gambling. Double or nothing. Come on. Hmm. Well, all right. Are you ready? I'm ready. Double or nothing. Here you are. Right hand or left? The left. Open it up. They are empty. <laughs> you know, that's a funny thing. That wouldn't happen again in a thousand times. Yeah, well, it won't happen again to me. Never mind. You'll sleep well tonight because you did a good deed for a worthy cause. Here's a button. Now you're one of us. I have contributed to War Relief Incorporated. Yeah. I have been taken by War Relief Incorporated. <laughs> Yeah, 
Joe beat him fair and square. That coin Joe used, though, had a little pin in it. When he put his hands behind him, he stuck it on the back of his coat, so it was never in either hand. Fair and square, according to Joe. But it saved the charity $1,200. And then there was a time he went down to the docks with Miss Bryant. There was more trouble about loading some trucks. I've been trying to think of some way to thank you for getting us the blankets. <laughs> well, the percentage was in our favor. The other guy was doing the guessing. You know, ever since you first came in, I've been trying to figure out why. Oh, now, look. What's a guy supposed to do? Put his heart on a plate before you'll trust him? What do you think you'll get out of helping us? I told you, I'm just trying to do my bit. That doesn't explain anything. Oh, well, I just don't like to talk about it, that's all. But why not look? The name of Bascopolis goes back a long time. You mean in Greece? Yeah, over there where them Nazis are pushing him around. How do I know what's happened to my brothers and my kid's sister? I lie awake nights trying to figure out how to help them. So now you know. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Oh, that's all right. Don't apologize. Sorry I had to tell you, that's all. <clears throat> now, uh, what about this guy we have to see? Oh, well, he won't unload our supplies until he gets a check. They're medical supplies, and they're important to save lives. I say, well, I'll talk to him. Joe, what's that in your hand? This? Oh, a roll of dimes. Why do you carry it? Oh. Habit fits nice in your hand. Joe talked to the guy all right. And when he got done, the guy really listened to reason. Of course, that pack of dimes in Joe's hand helped a little. Oh! The truck, boys. Joe, your face is cut. Oh, and your coat's all ripped. Oh, come on, let's get back to the charity. What happened in there? Oh, you misunderstood that guy. A nice fella, family man. What happened to your dimes? Huh? Oh, I tipped a guy. Did you have to tip him very hard? What, me? Fight? Go on, I'm a peace-loving citizen. Joe, he might have killed you. Oh, don't be silly. Just a scratch. Say, uh, would you mind if we stopped at the tailor so that I can get him to sew this fiddle? The what? The fiddle and flute. My suit. Oh, what kind of double talk is that? Oh, it's a language. I picked it up in Australia, like, uh, well, like shoes, ones and twos. Sounds like poetry. Yeah, well, that's the idea. Jingles. Like, uh, you're a girl, twist and twirl. Oh, well, what are you? Me? Oh, I'm a bloke. Heap of coke. <laughs> <laughs> well, this twist and twirl is going to take care of the heap of coke's scratch. Yeah, cabbage patch. <laughs> we'll stop at my house. It's on the way. Yeah. Oh. Anybody home? No. Hmm, fine. Have Mr. Biscopolis' coat fixed, Foster? Uh, yes, Miss Dorothy. Uh, will you take it off, please, sir? Yeah, sure. I'll get some bandages. What were you saying before, Joe? Oh, yeah. So the, uh, so the crunk and me are sitting in this coffee joint when in comes a pot and pan with his cheese and kisses. Pot and pan. That's a man. Yeah. Cheese and kisses. That's a missus. Sure. Well... <laughs> Well, the crunk said to me, Piper Heidzik, the I suppose on that guy's storm and strife in the Tommy Hornet. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm lost. Piper? Piper Heidzik, that's just pipe, you know. Take a look. Yeah, sir. At the I suppose. Oh, the nose? Yeah, on that guy's storm and strife in the Tommy Hornet. On his wife? Yeah. In the corner. Right. <laughs> well, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> the guy came over and punched the crunk in the snoot. Why? Well, the guy came from Australia. Oh. <laughs> Your coat, sir? Oh, here you are, John. Where can I wash up? Up to your left, sir. All right, well, don't go away, Miss Bryant. <laughs> I won't. Oh, Miss Dorothy. Yes? Shall I telephone for a bottle and stopper? A what? A copper in the American vernacular. Why, Foster, don't tell me you've been to Australia. Well, that's where I met my storm and strife, uh, Mrs. Foster. Oh. Uh, please forgive me, Miss Dorothy, but are you aware of the character of this gentleman? Oh, I think so. Why? You know he carries a lady from Bristol? A what? A pistol. In American parlance, a rod. Oh, well, don't be alarmed. I think it's part of his character. He, he carries it for balance. Uh, yes, Miss Dorothy. <laughs> Take the coat along, Foster, and see if Mrs. Barnes will sew it up. What's that, Foster? A coin, miss. It fell out of the pocket. Let me see that. Coin with a pin on the back. That's rather an unusual ornament, isn't it, miss? Oh, it's not an ornament, Foster. It's really very practical. Hi, 
you coming with the fiddle? Here you are. Thanks. By the way, Foster was quite alarmed. He thought I should send for a bottle and stopper. Yeah? What for? The lady from Bristol. Oh, that. <laughs> well, I wouldn't feel dressed without one. Have you ever killed anyone? No, I'm too good a shot. Look, uh, don't get me wrong. I'm a gambler, not a gangster. Tell me some more. Some more what? Some more jingle talk. Oh, that. <laughs> well, now, look. If we were going together, mm -hmm. well, you'd be my briny Marlin, my darling, see? Then I'd be the guy who'd give you that, uh, that simple Simon, diamond, for your long and linger, <laughs> finger. The guy who'd give me this simple Simon was my mother. Oh, yeah? More. Well, uh, Barnet Fair's your hair. Dots and dyes, eyes. The I suppose, nose. North and south, mouth. That's where you get the honey and bliss, kiss. Mm, Joe! That's enough, Joe. Come on, take off your mask. You're with friends. Don't be silly. Come on, Briny Marlin, don't play games. Let me go. I'm not playing games. Don't give me those baby blues. You think I brought you up here because... because... Well, didn't you? <laughs> or have you changed your mind? All right. Suppose we settle it with that game you played with McDougal. What, you, uh, you mean the coin stuff? Mm-hmm, behind the back. Okay. Well, here's a coin. Now, you ready? Mm-hmm. All right. Which hand is it in? Neither. Oh, no. Come on, play fair. You've got to guess. Neither. Open them both. Okay. You see? Oh. <laughs> it's in the left. But... Well, uh, <clears throat> looks like you lost. Well, uh, when you played it with McDougal, you... Yeah, I know. I pinned it on the back of my coat. <clears throat> but that was different. You never give a sucker an even break, but you don't cheat a friend. I believe in that. I live by it. You don't think I play phony with you, do you? Well, uh, you lost. Well, I... <laughs> I, I didn't know the rules of the game. Oh, you didn't? Well, okay. Where's my tit-for-tat hat? Joe, wait. What, what? Joe, will you run the gambling concession at the ball? Well, well, well. You sure you can trust me? Now I know I can. Okay, you got a deal. Hello, Grandfather. Foster said you wanted to see me. Yeah, sit down, Dorothy. Wait till I powder my eyes to pose and comb my barn at fair. Where on earth did you pick up such gibberish? <laughs> From Foster. It's wonderful slang, Grandfather. You should talk to him. I have been talking to Foster. Oh? What do you mean, Dot, by bringing a gangster into this house? <laughs> now, don't tell me you're worrying about me, Grandfather. I'd give you odds against any eight gangsters in the city, but I don't want them coming to my house. What can you see in a fellow like that? Joe's the first man I've ever met I'm afraid of. It's exciting. Joe, see here, Dot, this fellow hasn't been making advances to you, has he? Of course. He kissed me. What? Right on the north and south. I pretended to be angry, but the truth is I liked it. Now, see here. Oh, now, Grandfather, don't worry. Get rid of him, child. Get rid of him at once. Well, I, I suppose I should. Yes, I think he'd be too hard to tame. Good night, Grandfather. And Dot, what's his name? The heap of coke. Oh, you'll never believe me. Joe Biscopolis. Joe what? Biscopolis. <laughs> now, do you wonder why I call him by his first name? Good night, Briny Marlin. Biscopolis. Joe Biscopolis. Yes? Miss Bryant, there are three men here to see you. What about? Well, I, I think they're detectives, Miss Bryant. Oh. Well, send them in. Miss Bryant? Come in. Where can we find Joe Biscopolis? He isn't here. Where's his desk? Out there. Thanks. Wait. Uh, I'm so glad you came. My grandfather sent for you, didn't he? I always thought there was something wrong with Mr. Biscopolis. We want to have a little talk with him. Anything serious? When a guy's been convicted three times, carrying a gun is plenty serious. Oh. Oh, excuse me. I didn't know anyone was here. Oh, it's all right. Who's that? Oh, um, he's the man from the water company. It's about time you showed up, Inspector. Huh? Yeah, why? I've telephoned the water company several times today. Three bottles and stoppers arrived this morning with no coolant. Oh, oh. <clears throat> three, uh, <clears throat> three, uh, 
Sure. Three, uh, three bottles and stoppers, huh? Yes. Mm. Is this the best service you can give us? I've just about made up our mind to, to take our business elsewhere. Uh, where, for instance? Uh, I think the Plaza Fountain Place will serve our needs in the future. Okay, lady. Go on up to the Plaza Fountain Place. Will you sit down, gentlemen? I'm afraid you'll have to wait. <laughs> Joe. Hello, clever girl. I figured you meant you'd meet me at the fountain. Oh, Joe, I was scared. Say, why should the cops be trying to pick me up? Grandfather, you will carry a lady from Bristol. Oh, they're trying to pick me up for packing a rod, huh? I can get sprung in a couple of hours. Come on, my car's over here. Get in. What for? Now, don't ask questions. Get in. Okay. <laughs> Say, uh, we're not only out of town, we're out of the state. Is it all right for me to ask questions now, please, teacher? <laughs> I have to talk to Grandfather. Well, he's back in New York. Oh, I have to talk to him on the phone. We've passed thousands of good phones. No, this call must come from the right locality. Grandfather's no fool. Oh, well, how far is the right locality? Pretty far. Relax, mm. Joe. Hold the match up. I, I've got a key somewhere. Yeah. Say, uh, what is this place? The ancestral home. It's been closed a few months. Where do I turn on the lights? They're not connected. Oh. Is this the old man's place? No, mine. It comes from the other side of the family. The side that was always getting into trouble. Lend me your matches, Joe. You'll find some candles on the table. Yeah. Hey, uh, say, what's this over here? Just a little sitting room. A little? Oh, it's all right. This is where I used to entertain my bowls. Uh-huh. After tea, we'd sit by the fire and hold hands. Will you light the fire, Joe? Uh, oh, sure. <whistles> Hello, operator. Oh, it's all right. This is Miss Bryant. Oh, I'm fine, thank you. I want to talk to my grandfather in New York. Yes, that's the number. Will you ring? Thank you. Well, you know, for a family that was always getting into trouble, they did all right. Well, it was just that they never seemed to behave the way people expected them to. There are the family portraits. Look at them. <laughs> the crazy darlings. Maybe it will give you some idea of why I don't make sense. What did that one do? Well, he was a great admirer of the ladies. Ah. This one was a hunter and maker of 19th century love. Mm hmm Where'd he get his dough? From the first one. The next one wrote poetry, privately printed at his own expense. Yeah, Where'd he get his dough? From the second one. Oh. Well, where's the guy that made all the dough in the first place? Over here. My great-great-grandfather. From Log Cabin to Richard. Ah, oh, that's the guy. Hello? Oh. Well, will you call me when you get a line through? It's important. Hey, uh, what are you going to use for an argument when you get him? Oh, I'm not going to say much. He's going to do most of the talking. He's going to tell me about your three convictions, and I'm going to tell him I don't care. Wait a minute. What three convictions? Oh, don't pretend, Joe. It's all right. Oh, what are you talking about? I know all about it. The policeman told me today. Go on. I never took a rap in my life. Please, Joe, all be right, honest. All right, all right. I haven't always been on the level, but I kept my ears clean as far as John Law was concerned. Hello, Grandfather. Now, don't get excited. I'm in Maryland. Maryland. That's right. Hmm. Grandfather, you sent those policemen to the office today, didn't you? Well, listen... You know the laws of Maryland, don't you? Well, unless you give me your word of honor the police will be called off, I'm going to marry him. Marry him! Oh, I can't, can't I? I'll give you ten seconds to make up your mind. What? Give me your word, then. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Good night. Well, didn't I tell you to leave it up to me? Yeah, you're great. Well, it worked. Why wouldn't it work? You had a swell club to smack him with me. Joe. Hmm. You think the worst thing that could happen to you is to marry me? The people like you, folks like me, are animals. We're so bad, and you're so very good. <laughs> what do you expect, credit for it? How could you be anything else with what you had to start out with? You ought to be horsewhipped if you didn't turn out right. What are you so high and mighty about? What did you ever do? Joe. There's the guy up there. He made all your dough for you. And he was born in a log cabin. You know where I grew up? 
in a one-room shack with a dirt floor. You talk about this side of your family and that side of your family. As far as I know, we only had one side, and it was awful poor. Lots of times there wasn't what for to eat. That's why I ran away when I was nine. I got tired of being hungry and seeing my old lady go hungry until she died. Oh, please, Joe. Oh, well, I'm not complaining. It's okay with me. I just got a load in what gives with your kind of people. My kind? I just know that your kind can look through me like I was a pane of dirty glass. Oh, it's not me, Joe. It's, it's people like Grandfather. I thought you knew how I felt. Sure, I know. Anything for the cause. I'm not kidding myself, sister. I know how I stand with you after you cash in on me. You're wrong about me, Joe. You're all wrong. All right, come on. We can quarrel all the way back to New York. Wait a second. Did you mean that about me being wrong? I should have slapped your face. Well, why didn't you? Because you'd have slapped mine back. <laughs> I don't know what to make of a dame like you. Neither do I. Yes, I do, too. I suppose I've known for weeks that... that I'm in love with you. Hey. Oh, Joe... Joe, look at me. Won't you say something? Don't you like it? Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't know whether I like it or not. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a moment, Mr. DeMille brings back Cary Grant and Lorraine Day in Act Three of Mr. Lucky. But now, let's look in at a house around the corner where young Mrs. Adams is washing dishes and laying down the law at the same time. Any day now, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start rationing dishes around this house. You children can have one plate apiece, and if you want any more, you can just wash them yourself. Well, my hands are in such a state right now, I'm ashamed to look at them. Sounds to me like a case for Lux Flakes. Uh, say, uh, Mrs. Adams, oh. how would you like your hands to lose that ugly dishpan look and grow soft and smooth again? Why, I'd love it, but who's going to wash the dishes? You are. All you have to do is change from that strong soap you're using to gentle Lux Flakes. Well, how do you know just changing to Lux will help my hands? We've proved it by actual tests. Scores of women proved that simply changing from strong soaps to Lux Flakes for dishes gets rid of dishpan redness. Well, that certainly sounds worth trying. And that's not all. Those same gentle Lux flakes that are so kind to hands do more work, too. Lux does up to twice as many dishes as the same weight of other well-known soaps tested. And before you ask me, yes, we've proved that, too. You mean I can actually do more dishes with the same weight of Lux and have my hands look softer and smoother, too? Uh-huh, I do. <laughs> well, my goodness, what am I waiting for? I'll run down to the store and get some Lux flakes right this minute. And Mrs. Adams... If you don't find Lux Flakes in stock today, it's worth waiting for. Your dealer will have more soon. Remember, Lux does more dishes and saves your hands. Be sure you get Lux Flakes. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. There's a secret to tell about one of our stars after the play. But now the curtain rises on the third act of Mr. Lucky, starring Cary Grant and Lorraine Day. <laughs> Something funny happened to Joe after that. I guess it was falling for that girl the way he did. And then a letter came for Joe Biscopoulos, the real one who died. It was in Greek, and Joe took it down to a Greek church and asked the priest to read it to him. You wish to see me, my son? Uh, yes, Father, I got a letter. It's written in Greek. I'm kind of in a hurry, but I'll pay you if you read it for me. You can drop your offering in the fur box as you go out. I'm here to help those who need it. The letter is from your mother. Hmm? Oh. It oh. says, Joseph, my beloved son, God grant this letter reaches you. Always you have broken my heart by the wicked things you have done. 
Yet surely, when you hear of the terrible thing that has happened to those who love you, I believe that God will open your eyes and cleanse your heart. Uh, <clears throat> well, that's enough, Father. Thanks. I, uh, I just wanted to know who it was from. Listen. I write to tell you of my great pride in my other sons, your brothers. It happened two Sundays ago as we were coming from church. There was a roaring in the sky, and suddenly great parachutes began to drift down toward the meadow below the village. There were only five guns in our village, but there were pitchforks and scythes and men of great strength. Your brother Petros and your brother Euladio led the other men into the meadow. There were patches of white lilies, but before the hour was done, it was as though the field were covered with red lilies. No one of our men lived, but a hundred Germans died, and Rick Honor lived for an added hour. They possess our village, of course. I earn food by making their beds and washing their dishes at the inn. Yet I am sustained by my God and my great pride, thy mother, Maria. Thanks. Thanks, Father. May God comfort you, my son. It was that same day that we opened the gambling concession at the ball. It was a big night and the dough was rolling in. <laughs> Joe showed up about 11 o'clock. Gee, boss, you sure picked a soft touch. Yeah? I, uh, I guess we ought to leave something for charity, huh? You know, maybe a couple of grand. Hey, even so, our grab ought to be over 200,000. Hey, what's the matter, boss? Crunk, did you ever sit on a park bench for two hours and look at yourself? Our grab is nothing. Huh? But I thought you said we was taking a whole take. Just keeping out enough to pay off the boys. The rest goes to war relief. Yeah, but Joe... You don't mind if I double-cross myself, do you? Yeah, but look, Joe, you... You look. This charity bunch has a boat docking next week. They're loading her up with supplies going over to Greece. They need those things over there. And they're going to get them. Okay, Joe. Where's Joe? I gotta see him. Hey, there's Zep. Let him in and close the door. In here, Zep. What do you want here, Zepp? Listen, Joe, there were a couple of parole officers down at the boat. What they got on you? Not me, Jay Biscopolis. It turns out he was a three-time loser under the bombs law. Oh, that was it. Three convictions, huh? Yeah, and that puts you on the spot. One more rub with the law and Biscopolis goes up for life. You better beat it, Joe. Not tonight. Well, I stalled them off, but suppose they come here. My neck is clean. Take over the cash box, Crunk. I gotta see somebody. Where have you been, Brownie Marlin? What happened to you? Oh, I woke up. Oh, something happened to me, too. Yeah, what? I was struck by lightning. Look, you remember this. You were right, and I was wrong. For me, you're right, always. I see you get everything you want. You get enough to fill two ships, maybe three. There's something else I want. Oh, no. You stay away from guys like me. You'll only get hurt. I'm clearing out tonight. Clearing out? Where, Joe? Oh, what's the difference? Joe, take me with you. Please. Dorothy, this is Captain Costello of the police department. As your man, Captain. Grandfather, you broke your word. Nothing of the kind. Captain Costello is here to stop this gambling. Grandfather, you can't. Yes, he can. All right, we'll close up. I'll tell the boys. But, Joe... You're far enough ahead. Send the committee upstairs. We'll count up. All right, we're closing up, Crunk. Hey, hey, where's the Crunk? Close the door, Joe. Where is he? The boys took him inside. We're handling the money now. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. What is this? The law's downstairs. We're closing up. Who did you think you were fooling, Joe? We knew that dame had the ring through your nose. I'm declaring myself back in the old partnership. Any arguments? All that parole board needs to know is Viscopolis operated this game, and those one-way doors clank shut for good. 
I can prove I'm not Biscopolis. Okay, then you're Joe Adams, a draft dodger. That's good for ten years in Leavenworth. Better be a good boy, Joe. Okay, I know when I'm licked. Here come the dames to check up. Let them in. Don't open that door. Uh, Sit tight, Joe. I got a rod looking you right in the middle. Take it easy. What about the dough? We're taking it down the back way. Hmm. All of it, huh? Every nickel. Here it is, Zep. Yeah. Put it down, Zep. Hands off, Joe. Put it down, Zep. Get away or I'll... Now, put it down, Zep. Thank you. Zep, we gotta get out of here. Zep! Open up. Open this door. You've got the lights. Open up. Where's the back door? Somebody get a light. Joe got out in the dark. He went down the fire escape with the dough in his arms and the bullet in his chest. I met him at the boat and took the slug out of him. But he was a pretty sick guy. Next morning, he sent me around to the girl's house with the dough wrapped up in some newspaper. Wait a minute. Where is he? Where's who? Where did you get this money? The man I met in the park. He asked me to bring it to you. Oh, you're lying to me. Where is he? Where's Joe? Joe? I don't know any Joe. What did he look like? The man who gave you the money? I don't know. I never saw him before in my life. Oh, wait. Please. She tried to find him for weeks. But I had the guy hiding out. Meanwhile, everything went haywire on the charity deal. That boat they were supposed to load with supplies for Greece was knocked off by subs before it ever reached New York. And then one day at the girl's house, the detective showed up with some news. Well, we solved that case for you, Miss Bryant. He's dead. Who's dead? Miss He was a wrong guy, all right. Look at that record. Three years at San Quentin, two at Leavenworth, five at Sing Sing. This picture. What's the matter? This isn't... This... That's not Biscopolis? No. Oh, that's him, all right. We checked with the captain of the gambling boat he was on. He was missing. The boat was missing, too. And we finally ran it down. Over at Pier 48, they're loading a ship called the Briny Marlin with medical supplies from your office. What? What did you say the name of the ship was? The Briny Marlin. At least that's what they call it now. The Briny Marlin. The briny morning. The boat was just pulling out when she got there. She came running down the dock, calling to him. Joe! He was standing at the rail, kind of smiling. Joe! Joe, take me with you. Please, darling. I love you. Please take me. You don't belong with a grifter like me. You just got some mud on your dress, that's all. Give it time. Let it dry. It'll brush off. Oh, no, Joe. Joe, I love you. Please take me with you, Joe. Please, Joe. Please. Goodbye, Brownie Marlin. Well, that's it. She never saw him again. That's why she's standing down there now at the end of the dock. She comes here every night. Well, what happened to the Greek? We delivered the stuff. Then he joined the Merchant Marine, and coming back, the briny marlin drew a dead heat with a German torpedo. Hmm. Funny a guy like him winding up that way, huh? Yeah, you can't kill a fella like Joe. That's him now. Hey, Joe. Hi, Sweet. Where you been? Waiting for you, that's all. Come on, Joe. The dinghy's at the end of the pier. Let's get back to the ship. No, nope, change my mind. We're not going back to the ship. It's our last night ashore. We're going uptown. Okay, but you got to go down and tie up that dinghy anyway. What? Why should I? Because I'm telling you to. It's an order. Uh, okay. She's turning around. I think she sees him. Yeah. It's okay. That's a real finish. We can go now. Ah, Briny Marlin. Briny Briny Marlin. Marlin. Our stars will be back in a moment for a curtain call. Meantime... Here's a true story about how highly one girl valued her nylon stockings. 
She actually turned in a fire alarm to save them. She felt herself falling and caught at the nearest support, which turned out to be the handle of a firebox. Well, fortunately, there's a way to save those precious stockings of yours without calling out the fire department. Just lux them after every wearing. Yes, in a whole series of tests, Lux cut-down runs over 50%. Rayon, nylon, silk, and cotton stockings all were tested. All gave the same kind of results. Stockings washed with Lux flakes didn't go into runs nearly as quickly as those rubbed with cake soap or washed with a strong soap. Lux cut stocking runs in half. You see, Luxing saves the elastic qualities of your stockings so they can stretch and spring back into place again when you strain them instead of breaking easily into runs. You'll find Lux care for stockings really pays. So if your dealer should be out of Lux flakes next time you ask for them, it will pay you to wait. He'll have more soon. Remember, Lux cuts down stocking runs by over 50%. Gives you extra wear from every pair. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Thanks to the good work of Cary Grant and Lorraine Day, we've checked off another hit in the Lux Radio Theater. And now we bring the stars of Mr. Lucky back to the footlights. Thank you, C.B. Any fun of the place opposite Lorraine Day is Mr. Lucky. <laughs> I'll hmm? bet he says that to all the girls, Mr. DeMille. Uh, Lorraine takes her work very seriously, Gary. Right now, I believe she's studying photography. So she'll know more about uh, light and shadow and angles. Well, she's right. The picture business has a lot of angles. Camera angles. Oh, oh. I think pictures are just like anything else. You've got to study your job. I started when I was a youngster playing games. What, cowboys and Indians? Playing with cowboys and Indians. Excuse me. We lived on a ranch right next door to the Ute Indians, and I learned to ride and rope by the time I was ten. Now, personally, I like a leading lady who can ride and rope, but I guess it was never much help to you on the screen, Lorraine. The first three pictures I made were which way they go, they went that away, pictures. <laughs> Well, you never can tell when your early training will help you. When I was a kid, I collected caterpillars. Now I'm making a picture with Janet Blair and Curly. Curly? Curly? I, I, I don't seem to know the name. Uh, Curly's a caterpillar. Oh, oh, indeed. Uh, is, uh, is Curly a boy or a girl caterpillar? See, B, I don't see how that could matter except to another caterpillar. <laughs> To cover Mr. DeMille's confusion, yeah, believe I... me, that'll take some covering, too. <laughs> well, I'll ask him what play he's producing next week. No, thank you, Lorraine. It's, uh, it's slightly dangerous. Huh? What is? Now, don't start that again, Gary. Oh. It's the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer picture hit, Slightly Dangerous. And our stars will be Lana Turner and Robert Cummings. It's the story of a young girl who discovers a way to change her personality and find some very gay adventures all at the same time. Slightly dangerous, but much more than slightly entertaining. Well, it sounds great, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. There was gold in that star acting. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents... Lana Turner and Robert Cummings in Slightly Dangerous with Jean Lockhart. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Ladies and gentlemen, your waste paper is needed now to help war production. It directly replaces wood pulp in making newsprint and paperboard. So don't throw away or burn your newspapers. Sell them to a junk dealer. Give them to a charitable organization or consult your local newspaper for the date and method of your local salvage collection. Send your waste paper to war. Cary Grant will soon be seen in the Columbia picture, My Client Curly. Lorraine Day appeared tonight through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios, producers of the Technicolor musical, Thousands Cheer. Heard in tonight's play were Arthur Hole as Swede, Verna Felton as Veronica, Eddie Marr as Crunk, Ed Emerson as Zepp, and Charles Seal, Fred Mackay, Griff Barnett, Arthur Q. Bryan, Dorothy Scott, Norman Field, Catherine Craig, Ken Christie, and Boyd Davis. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in next Monday night to hear Lana Turner, Robert Cummings, and Jean Lockhart in Slightly Dangerous. Make sure you get the vitamins and minerals your family needs in spite of food shortages. 
Get Vims. They're scientifically designed to help make meals complete. Vims give you all the vitamins government experts say are essential, balanced in the formula doctors endorse. All the minerals commonly lacking, too. Yet Vims cost only a nickel a day in the family size at your druggist. It's B.I. for vitamins, double M.S. for minerals. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.